Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. We're still missing Brian Broom, but we are planning to have him back with us next week. And we're in the middle of the story of Gideon. Uh, we've reached the point where he throws out a fleece. And uh, in common parlance, throwing out a fleece would be like proposing a test to find out the will of God regarding a certain thing. Like, right. uh, yeah. Is that what Gideon's doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's read the text for starters. Sounds good. You mean we actually have to start with what the Bible says? We don't just get yeah, to the, like... The, there's, there's something in that, I think, that's, that's ironically fitting here. <laughs> so at this point, Gideon's got his whole hometown and his family on his side. And the tribes of Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali. So he's got a pretty good sized army. And yet there's a hesitation. Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, threshing floor, and as the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then I shall know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, uh, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and all the ground, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. This is the first time I've actually noticed how many times it says, as thou hast said, <laughs> as thou hast said. <laughs> yeah. So, God has revealed something to him in advance? That's what I'm yeah, picking up. Yeah. God has already told him that he's going to deliver the Midianites into his hand. And Gideon acknowledged this, acknowledges this at least twice. And so the question, the thing that comes up, well, didn't Gideon set out a fleece to know the will of God? No, he knew the will of God. He's <laughs> after something else. He, knew, he says very plainly, I know what you said. So the divine revelation was already verbal revelation, propositional revelation. I will do this for you. This is what will be the result to the Midianites. And, and yet, Gideon, as it were, puts God to the test. And most likely what's happening here, we need to remember that Gideon was raised in a, a household where Baal was central. Now, as, as is often true today, and was often true more in my generation, perhaps, and the, the one just before, <clears throat> it, it, it is and was common enough to give lip service to God who made the world, God who has a good purpose in everything, God who is love, God who made you special. And, and loves that, you very much. And loves you very much. And that's about it. Someone's called it therapeutic deism. Uh, but in terms of everyday stuff, depending on your leanings, we turn either to natural law, science, the forces of nature conceived of as abstract forces and principles at work in the universe. And strangely enough, it is a universe, although God doesn't seem to be the unifying factor here. Or if you have more of a New Age mentality, there are spirit guides and exalted masters and other ilk of spirits and powers <clears throat> excuse me, that you can appeal to. In other words, God's great as kind of a limiting, or, um, what is that word? Limiting concept or as a uh, safety net for your system so that if anyone ever asks you, you can admit that there is meaning back of all this somewhere, somehow. <laughs> it is, in fact, a universe for some reason. But in terms of normal everyday life, God recedes into the background, and there are other forces that are closer at hand and that we are much more concerned with. Uh, I'm, For some strange reason, I am thinking of the TV children's show, Johnny Quest, which came out in the 60s. Are you familiar with it? 
I haven't seen it. You've told me a little bit about it. Yeah, you, you should. It was very well done for what it was. But the father is uh, a scientist. He is a top scientist apparently because he has to be guarded by some kind of American intelligence agent 24 hours a day. And But the hero is the son, Johnny, who's 10, 11, 12, someplace in there. And his friend, who's kind of adopted the family, young boy named Haji. Uh, I remember a an episode, and it's strange that when I was a kid, this was still a thing. There's a scene where the boys are kneeling down by their bed and praying mm -hmm. as they go to bed. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it's a nod of some sort to family values, and yes, everybody, even even scientists acknowledge there's a god of some sort. But if you watch the entire series. We, we, we get the idea that there are rights and wrongs and that there are some things worth risking your life for. But there's never any, as far as I remember, no other mention of religion or religious philosophy. It's just science will solve all of our problems. <laughs> and I think that was pretty typical of the generation just before mine. <laughs> your generation discovered that science couldn't solve all of your problems. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it, you know. Um, there was the, the and, and, and the same thing shows up in, in old TV shows. Uh, the only TV show I know of today, and, and I don't know many for that, where you see prayer going on is uh, Blue Bloods, and they are explicitly Roman Catholic. Uh, they, they is this go, the police family in yeah. New York or Boston yeah. or something? It's in New York. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom Selleck leads the cast. It's, it's once you get into it, it's it's pretty good. Uh, but in some ways, they um, I think they're better than typical Catholics in the very strong values. The family gets together after – well, they go to church together. Mm -hmm. and But even more of a ritual is – and afterwards, we all go over to dad's house where grandpa is also there. Then we all have family dinner together and everyone is expected to be there. Mm -hmm. And we all love each other. Even when That's we're having, how it works. <laughs> yeah, and we're having, even if we're, you know, having <laughs> personal feuds, we come and we, we try to bury them and get along with each other because this is what's important. And they pray every single time. Now, of course, there's the crossing yourself in Roman Catholic fashion, and some of the prayers are less than Orthodox, shall we say? <laughs> and at one point, one of the one of the young ladies says, "Oh, I just learned a Buddhist prayer. Can I do that?" Like. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but there there was a time when families praying was not absent from TV. Two odd examples. The Brady Bunch. When the family did go to church, because at one time the mom was supposed to sing in church and lost her voice. It was for a Christmas mm -hmm. uh, concert. And so the whole show was about that. And will King Santa Claus get her her voice back so she can sing to Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was that was weird, um, but the uh, TV sci-fi show Lost in Space before it got very silly. Mm -hmm. The first few episodes were pretty serious, and there's a point when the family has escaped danger and they all kneel down, and the father pulls out a book, presumably the Bible, and leads the family. You know, we're, we're kind of at a distance; we don't really hear what's going on, but I think they said something about we. It was time to give thanks or something like that. An echo of the original um, Swiss Family Robinson, the Space Family Robinson. Up front, there is still in that generation room for this sort of thing where you would acknowledge God, and yet ultimately, when it came down to, but but who made the world and how to get it? Well, let's talk about evolution, and let's talk about forces, and let's talk about you know all of that, biological necessity and biochemical conditioning, and you know, all the all the blah 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 science steps in. Not that it doesn't have a place, but it it more and more became. A dominant factor in American thinking until the 60s. Then we had the backlash uh, with flower children and all of that, where no science has created this horrible uh, impersonal culture, this plastic culture where nothing means anything, where all become numbers in the machine, we're all cards in a computer file. Well, back then, computers were programmed with cards. <laughs> uh, and so we, we went away from that. We want to. Expand our consciousness and find God on some other level on the whole movement toward the occult, toward New Age mysticism and Eastern mysticism, and very literally putting spirits back in place. Yeah, there may be a God someplace behind all this, but spirits are, are, are more 
immediate, more mm -hmm. helpful. And so to bring this back to Gideon, Gideon is faced with the same thing that pretty much every non-Christian generation will be faced with, where there is still the memory of the worship of the true God. God will slowly recede into the background and forces, whether they be conceived of as natural and scientific or semi-personal and magical, will come to the fore. And it becomes a question of uh, manipulating those forces. Now, Baal was the god of storms and sunshine and anything masculine and violent in nature. <laughs> Uh, and, and Wait, that's gender stereotyping. <laughs> it was. They gender stereotyped a lot because they didn't have a Christian balance that said, hey, women actually are significant. <laughs> the ancient world didn't have to put up with, uh, we, you know, that is just, we don't care. We can, if we can beat up on the woman, we don't care. Um, the pagan culture did not treat women very well most of the time, something that um, some feminists have real trouble believing. Yeah. Despite goddess worship. <laughs> Despite goddess worship, because the way you worship the goddess was you found a prostitute and abused her. I mean, yeah. that's not, and, and uh, for instance, in Assyria, women to, to move into the phase of being women as opposed to girls had to go to the, the Temple of Astarte and sell their services to a random male stranger. That was just one of their the things they that was required and expected in that culture. That was goddess worship. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was not what people think it was. So anyway, here's Gideon. He's grown up in this environment where to get at nature, there are certain things. There's, there's magic you do, or science, if you will, ways of manipulating natural forces that that he's learned. And um, it's all part of the grand irrationality of nature, of, of the universe. The, nature, the universe has a somewhat rational, but the strong side of irrationality bound together, because this is inevitable in pagan concepts without a creator God. You, you, you try to make sense of it, and then ultimately you realize, but there's no sense because there's no final voice uniting it all. So you start trying to manipulate cause and effect, yeah, and then find out that there is no cause for the effect <laughs> that you need, and so you just resort to more drastic and more drastic measures. More drastic, more drastic. You try okay. to scare nature into doing what you want. That's what what Gideon was used to, and yet here comes a personal god, as it were, out of the past, <clears throat> out of folklore, out of memory, out of the Bible, who he stands and talks to in ordinary words. Nothing highfalutin, nothing mysterious, no kind of strange, exotic, esoteric speech he can't understand. He says, a man, as Lewis says in a different context, as when a man meets another man on the road. He just, they're just talking and it's not that hard. <laughs> but what this man, this angel, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord has said is, I'm going to give you an incredible victory over forces that are way beyond anything that you're ready to cope with. And I promise it's because I'm the creator of the universe. And you should know about this because you've heard of the miracles. Yeah, I've heard of them. They're in this old book. I haven't seen any. Um, could you do one, please? Sort of a crisis of faith. Yes, I've talked to him. Yes, he's told me what to do. Yes, he's promised me what he will do. But my whole culture has told me this is not the way religion works. So, would you mind just um, putting some flesh and bones on the theology? And then nothing big, just here. The, um, I never remember the order. I'll put the fleece of wool on the floor. And um, in the morning, if all the dew's on the fleece and the ground's dry, then that'll be you. Because that's not normally quite how it works. And yet, after it happens, he thinks, wait. What if the fleas simply soaked up all the water from the ground? I, I think I need another sign. I need it to happen backwards. I, I need God to show me that this is not simply a natural process mm -hmm. that he kind of tagged on to. I need him, I need it to clearly be a miracle. So the test run said the water goes toward the fleas. I want, Lord, would you please do it the other way? And God doesn't rebuke him. Uh, although Gideon's afraid he will. He <laughs> says, let me prove thee, I pray thee, once with the fleece, let it be dry only upon the fleece and upon the ground let there be dew. And it was so. 
So God is in charge of even little things like the way dew moisture flows in a small contained area. He rules nature down to the smallest details. And that's what Gideon needed to know. Uh, we can and there's you. humility in his asking. Like you know, Again, we can contrast with Zechariah, who's like, well, what sign are you going to give me? <laughs> and the angel says, you're, you're not asking this in faith. So yeah. <laughs> the sign you get is going to be not very fun for you. Um, but when it, Gideon says to God, let not thine anger be hot against me, that proves that he knows that he doesn't, it's not his right to have this sign. God would no. have reason to be angry. And he's asking him to please not. <laughs> yeah, please, please don't. I mean, I, I in my head, I know how this works. And in my head, as I understand theology, this could really tick you off. However, I really, really, really need something beyond the rational. I need you to show me that God acts in the affairs of men, that God rules the universe. Not just in terms of general broad principles, but he can set aside his regularities the covenant faithfulness we call natural law, and he can do miracles. Doesn't have to be a big miracle. Uh, I just, it's, it's not so, quite, so much a question of what is God capable of, but is God capable of anything? Can God interfere with the regularity of nature with Baal? Mm -hmm. And even in a small way, because either Baal's in control or God is who he says he is. And if God proves even on a small scale that Bail nature is nothing to him and that he's completely sovereign and all these things, then then my faith will be buoyed up. I will understand that indeed what I heard at my perhaps grandparents' knees or someplace along the line is the truth. Now, God does not promise us in this age of grace that kind of reassurance because we have a completed Bible. Uh, Gideon had the Torah and Joshua. I think that's it. Maybe Job, if it was circulating around, it may not have come till later. Uh, he, he didn't have all that we have. Messiah had not yet come. The Holy Spirit had not yet been poured, poured out. So, and, and then the whole history of the Old Testament where God constantly throws down false gods and asserts his sovereignty, he didn't have that. And so, God is willing to for this instant, for for this necessity, grant a form of special revelation, a miracle, uh, and a largely uninterpreted one. Uh, God does not say what this means, nor does he say whether or not it's a symbol or allegory or image of something. And I've seen a number of attempts that, well, the bull, it's a threshing floor, so it seems to be significant. Water's significant. Sheep skins are significant. <laughs> There's got to be something here, but I've never seen anybody come up with something that either Conclusive. satisfied really them or, yeah, they were satisfied me. So maybe, maybe there is something. I would not discourage anyone from trying to find it. But the, the major uh, point here is simply the sovereignty of God to the point that nature is actually not a thing. Hmm. There is no thing called nature. There is the creation ordered and ruled personally by a sovereign God who does as he will. And generally, out of covenant faithfulness, does things in a regular predictable fashion. So predictable that we can describe some of those things with mathematical formulas. God At a makes, certain scale. <laughs> yeah. God <laughs> makes apples fall toward earth at a speed that can be, or uh, with a force that can be calculated as uh, G times mass, one times mass, two over R squared. You know, it's, it's that accurate. We can measure down to the nanosecond, the nanometer and below. Of course, when we start getting up at speeds near light or things below or down toward the quantum level, some of those rules don't seem to work so much anymore. It doesn't mean there aren't any. It just means that God's bigger in his thoughts than we are. And the patterns that we see may not be all there are to the patterns, and that's okay. Because what God guarantees, for instance, is not that objects in Earth's gravity well will fall at minus 9.8 meters per second squared, but that the, the down will be down, <laughs> and things will fall, and, 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 and things, uh, summer, winter, springtime harvest, all of these things will be constant, cold and heat, summer and winter, 
All of these things will be constants. Not exactly promise that all natural rates or natural constants will be forever constant, but they will continue in such a way that man can do his job. God has set us about the task of dominion. And if, say, the, the um, gravitational constant shifted every day, we couldn't even build buildings or bridges. Mm -hmm. We couldn't even plant food. If the sun fluctuated in its uh, the discharge of its of its radiation, we could burn all our crops up in one afternoon and then go freezing four months on end. God promises regularity so that we can do the work he's called us to. Dominion implies predictability, uh, a pattern of behavior on God's side that we can trust. Not because God is bound by any law of nature, mm -hmm. um, but because for our sakes and so that God can fulfill can give us the platform we need to work on, God is covenantly faithful to maintain the universe and what seem to us as fixed patterns and rates. But there is no there is no natural law. In fact, natural law is itself an interesting metaphor. <laughs> you know, um, so where, where are the courts where people are dragged for breaking <laughs> natural law? Where are the natural law cops? You Gravity. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And more than once, I have I've spoken to Christian teachers and such in church about uh, this, and have said, "All right, get you ready for a paradigm shift. True or false? Natural. God created the natural laws that run the universe." And I say, and I usually say, "And if this is such a trick question." And yet, people, Christians, Christian educators will raise their hand and say, yeah, it, it is true that God created the natural laws that run the universe. And I just have to say, something. no. They're on <laughs> Main their, verb on. of this sentence, <laughs> or a secondary verb, I guess. Yeah. Well, they hear God created, mm -hmm. and they're all about that. They don't hear the rest of it, right. the natural laws that run the universe. First of all, God created natural laws. No, he didn't. I mean, where, where, where do you find these natural laws? Can where are you, they written? Yeah, where are they written? Can you email them? Can you uh, take a picture of them? Yeah. Can I, Mr. Rodney, can I take out my phone and take a picture of what's on the board? You know, we can't do that with natural laws. They are patterns of behavior that we deduce by constant observation. There's no mechanism that forces the universe to work the way it does. It's God's hand. It's God's power. Edward Catechism says, what do you mean by the providence of God? The everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he upholds heaven and earth and all that's in them, and so governs them, and it gives a list of uh, rain and sunshine and fruitful and barren years and drought, and uh, all of these things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. That's the biblical doctrine of providence over against the doctrine of natural law, which is basically Baalism. Nature is self-sustaining, self-regulating, and you, you, we're, we're bound by it. All we can do is try to get into the system and work with the system, deduce the code and hop on to the computer line and hope that we can uh, work with it. But Scripture gives us a personal God who can stop doing it. He can stop the sun in its tracks. He can undo death. He can undo the degeneration of a mortal body. Uh, it's these are very different concepts, and unfortunately, from late eighteen hundreds on, and particularly in the nineteen fifties and early sixties, uh, American society and particularly the church bought into this concept of a God who started the process and backed off, and now it's all about learning the natural laws if we want to invent technology and get anywhere. And God is nodded to praised in our political speeches. Well, it goes we, back further than that, doesn't it? I mean, you've got the, the well, Thomas Jefferson doesn't count as Christian <laughs> culture for obvious reasons, but his entire yeah. milieu yeah. has this idea that natural law is something that can be rationally deduced right. from the way things work rather than from what God has stated. But Jefferson and his ilk tended to be sort of an elite. They were the educated people mm -hmm. who didn't have to work for a living. That's fair. <laughs> and what's and what's what what happened, particularly in the fifties, I think it's reflected in television and in the world I grew up in, fifties and early sixties, is that uh, everybody is thinking that way now. It's mm -hmm. taught in the public schools. Mm -hmm. It's taught on TV. It's not taught as an assault on scripture yet. That will come in the mid sixties on, 
but it's taught as, well, you can have the Bible, you can have your religion, that's one realm, but practical stuff, that's science. And so, again, to, to, to bring us back to where we were, uh, this is what Gideon's up against. He's, he's caught in that uh, state of being in two minds. Uh, there's a God who rules the universe, who's rescued his people in the past, but science, but the spirits, but magic. And he's trying to sort it out. And God, it, 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 it is it is interesting that God does not rebuke him. Zechariah, the priest you mentioned with regard to John the Baptist, had no excuse. He's a priest. <laughs> he's, he's living at a time when Israel has thrown off its idols, finally. And uh, they have the whole Old Testament. They have the entire Old Testament. He has so little. And, he, and, he's, and he's not doing it after the fact, like... Well, I saw an angel yesterday, didn't I? Didn't I? Was that real? I don't know. Was I dreaming? I he's actually girlfriend? talking to he's the angel. He's talking to the angel <laughs> at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, he gets what he deserves on that one. Uh, and there were prophecies in place that said this was coming. And the angel says, your prayers are heard. So, whatever he was praying about is fulfilled in John the Baptist. Uh, he, he may have been praying very specifically Lord, it's time for the Messiah. Please send the herald that you promised. Okay. Right. Yeah, <laughs> wait, you didn't really mean okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, wait, you, I prayed for it, but that doesn't mean I expected you to actually do it or anything. Oh, man. I, mean, I do that in my prayers all the time. <laughs> it's like, oh, yes, Lord, I did ask for that perfect job to come at the perfect moment, but I didn't expect it to actually come at the perfect time. For- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's what we get growing up in our culture when God is <laughs> remote and we don't expect Him to actually intervene. I, I've I will not claim any great faith in this area. I mean, I'm probably as, as subject to anybody else in doubting God and forgetting God's promises. But over the years, I have seen some very marvelous the Puritans would call them special providences. Where, you know, what are the odds? Um, apparently 100% in this case, if the thing you were looking for just showed up at the door with a bow around it. Okay. All right. I can take that. That's, that's yeah. Mm. Uh, there, are, there are lots of stories, but I won't, I won't tell any of them now. So, we, we, we come to this in part as a response to those who today, as you say, use the phrase, throw out a fleece. If I want to know today what God's will is for my life, can't I do what Gideon did? God, Gideon wanted to know what God's will was, and so he set this test for God. Well, we've seen that's not what happened there. But let's let's consider what this looks like and what it's looked like culturally. Uh, Several generations ago now, probably the uh, early 1900s and then back a few generations before that, there were a number of customs in America, in rural America, usually, where people had interesting ways of finding out God's will. It's hard to know at this end of things how seriously they took them. Um, one I ran into was this. A young girl places a key on the first page of the book of Ruth. She shuts the Bible, binds it closed with a ribbon, uh, but she carefully leaves the top of the key exposed. Then she puts her finger into the keyhole and holds the Bible up in the air. She begins to speak the names of possible suitors. When the Bible spins or jerks or falls, she has discovered the name of her true love. <laughs> Folk custom prescribes a similar ritual for learning the identity of thieves and finding hidden treasure. <laughs> well, won't that work? No, that doesn't. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, and, and folk, the, oh yeah. yeah, folk culture has multiplied all kinds of these things. Um, some mm-hmm. would seem completely strange and foreign to us. Like this one, I, mm-hmm. I'd never heard until I saw this particular incident. But there are other things that people do. Of course, the, one of the more common ones is open the let the Bible fall open by itself. Put your finger down, and whatever you read there, that's God's will for you for the moment. And we've all heard the uh, <laughs> And apocalypse. Judas hung himself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, that couldn't be it. Let me try it again. Okay, Go thou here. and do likewise. <laughs> okay. Maybe not. All right, one more time. There. What you do, do quickly. And there we go. 
Yeah, we didn't rehearse that, so <laughs> we both heard nope, it a lot of times. <laughs> uh, and people can smile at it, but it's it's not unusual for people to think that that's a way to get at what God wants. Which is and treating it, the Bible as a tool for superstition. It's yeah. not taking the Bible on its terms. Yeah. And, and when we started this, you you made the the remark about, oh, we're actually going to read the Bible. <laughs> yeah, we're going to read it and not just use it as a sort of Ouija board to find out by some outside mechanical means, magical means, with what God wants. We're going to assume that the Bible is, in fact, a word and, and a whole bunch of words, actually, from God. Uh, that is infinite wisdom he has given to us so that at any given time, through proper study and comparing Scripture with Scripture, we can know what God wants. When we Theology distinguishes two different meanings of the will of God. Mm -hmm. Will of God can mean what has God decreed? What has God, in his infinite sovereignty, planned for the world? And what will he bring to pass? That's his business and mostly it's secret. Sometimes it's called the secret will of God or the decreed will of God. He's told us some things. He's told us for instance, it's appointed to men once to die and after this the judgment. So we all know that unless we live to see the coming of Jesus, we're going to die. That's a certainty. Well, there were Enoch and Elijah, but beyond that. <laughs> And there was Lazarus who actually died twice, you know, but as a general principle, okay, God has told us that. God has promised, um, I, I quoted this badly earlier, I will actually read the text now. At the end of um, Genesis 8, God promised Noah this, uh, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And so, until the end of redemptive history, the laws of thermodynamics will apply, cold and heat. The earth will continue to spin on its axis and continue its revolution around the sun, day and night. It will maintain its tilt on its axis so that we'll have summer and winter. And the connection between these things and the germination of plants will be a constant. So, these things God has promised. In other words, unless Jesus comes, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. We can be certain about that. God has told us this. Um, and, and there you might find a few other things where God has said in advance, look, this is the way the universe works, and I'm promising you it will continue to work that way. Other things uh, may be really constant and, and, and generally reliable, and that's what a good deal of science is about, trying to see what else there is and how far we can push this promise into, into other areas. Thermodynamics underlies chemistry and physics, which underlie biology and, and botany. So there may be other things we can deduce from this where we can say, you know, if I light, if I put a match under this paper, it will burn. Not great as prophecies go, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's, there, there are things we can tell here. Fairly predictable. Fairly predictable. One that... Wait, uh, Usually when I've heard the the phrase the decreed will of God, it's referring to more the the mysteries of life, though, the things that are that we trust to God's providence but don't necessarily make sense to us. Like, why is there sin in the world? Everything that happens, God decrees, but clearly God doesn't want us to sin, but he allows it to happen. So how does that work? And that's what I've heard as described as the secret will of God. Is that Accurate? Um, I would think that would be putting too narrow an edge on it. The okay. secret will of God is anything that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So, yes, everything you described is certainly within the secret will of God. There are things that we don't understand about how God does things or how in his perfect holiness he's able to do such things. How, how does he tolerate sin in the world? How does he decree the actions of sinners and yet not be responsible for their sin? There's, there's a lot there that's, that's mystery to us. Uh, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children, that we may do all the words of His law. So that's Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. There, and that would be the the underlying proof of this distinction that we're trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good verse to this point. Um, so there's that, and so generally, we we don't know the secret will of God. Sometimes we really, really would like to. One of my former students said, wouldn't it be great if you were born with the name of the person you're supposed to marry tattooed on one hand and your calling in life on the other? 
<laughs> you know, it wouldn't really solve everything. Okay, Mary. <laughs> Mary. Mary. Do you know how many Marys there are in the world? <laughs> You're gonna be an engineer. What kind of engineer? Build, yeah, I'm gonna build bridges, in fact. Uh, <laughs> you know. Domestic engineer. I'm gonna work in a kitchen all my life. That I didn't you know. Not everything is as clear as it might seem to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that would it, take a lot of the romance out of it. Yeah, it would, <laughs> most literally. And it would still leave many, many others. And then there would be other things we weren't. Well, where am I supposed to live? Well, who am I supposed to work for exactly? Um, how many children are we going to have? You know, there constantly will be things we'll want to know. And God has just said, it's none of your business. <laughs> you will find out as they happen. I've asked my students... A number of times, how will you know who God has planned for you to marry? And I, they're, they're pretty good at it these days. They say, when you say, when she says, or he says, I do. I mean, it's not the engagement ring, it's not the promise, it's not the falling in love. I know two dear people who have been very, people who have been very dear to me who were sure they were going to get married and things were going that way and everything was great. And then suddenly he, died under very um, difficult and somewhat mysterious circumstances. And she was left devastated. They both had been looking for someone to marry for a long time, and they found each other with help from friends. And it, it just at the last second, God said, no. If you had asked them, who's God planning for you to marry? I'm sure they would have pointed at the other person, and yet it wasn't it. And then there are movies like Runaway Bride, where, you know, you just, <laughs> it's until the rings on the finger and the vow is said, in fact, you can even push for the marriage license signed. Um, you don't know. And so we wait. We find out that one day at a time, one hour at a time, one second at a time, as God unfolds his plan for us. And he has made no promises beyond those few things that I mentioned. Jesus is going to come back one day. We're going to die someday if, he, if we're not, that the other doesn't happen first. And the normal phenomena of life will continue so that we can exercise our call of dominion. That's about it. There's there's no guarantee that God's going to tell you anything secret, whether he's going to keep his secrets, and you'll find out the same way everyone else does. And of course, if you're one of those people who picks up a book and has to read the last chapter first, <laughs> this is frustrating. No, I, can't, I, can't, I can't read a book until I'm sure it's going to end well. I got to read the first, I got to read the last page first. That, you know, it's that's like child. All the questions that I get from my fifth graders every yeah. day. Are we going to do this today? Are we going to do that today? I'm like, wait and see. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> you don't have to ask me before yeah. it happens. You can just experience it. As God wills. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the other God wills. And that's what God has told us he wants us to do. How shall we then live? The moral will. The moral will, the ethical will, the perceptive, preceptive will. And that's found in the Bible. God tells us in general terms and in very specific terms how we are to live. And in this sense, finding the will of God is generally not hard. Now, there are exceptions, and the exceptions are usually ones that, that catch us off guard and we make a big deal out about them. But there are so many things that are not hard to figure out. Shall I cheat with my neighbor's wife? No. Shall I that cheat one's on this? Pretty clear. Shall I cheat on this test? No. Should, <laughs> I, clear. should I go to church on Sunday? Should I skip church on Sunday simply because I want to sleep in and I'm lazy? No. no. Um, you know, uh, I really hate that guy's guts. I have a knife here. Can I? Can I? You know, thrust it into his belly? Would God approve of that? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, there are so many things every day that we could ask questions about, but we don't because we know either directly, indirectly, instinctively, or explicitly that God has said these are wrong. It's called morality. And although in, in this generation, more and more people are denying that there is such a thing, Christians have no excuse. We've read the Bible. It claims to be the word of God. It tells us how to live. And while there occasionally are things where one commandment or principle seems to be at odds with another, um, those are the rare exceptions. Most things are awfully, awfully plain. The problem is not that we don't know God's will, but that we know it all too well and simply don't want to do it. Mm 
-hmm. It's scary. It's difficult. Uh, it's going to require too much of us. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to put us outside of our comfort zone. I know God wants me to go over to Susie and apologize to her, but she's just going to gloat and laugh at me. And I don't want, I can't, I, I'll look like an idiot. I, that can't possibly be God's will. He wouldn't want that, those bad things to happen to me. God's a God of love. Oh, glad I got over that. All right, moving on. <laughs> and we rationalize in terms of our own interpretations. We, 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 uh, isolate and deify one attribute like love or our conception of justice or acceptance or patience or something. And we ignore what God has clearly told us elsewhere. This is the way walk ye in it. In words. <laughs> in words. The words the words are clear. And and there's really, again, there 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 are a few things. You could think of the recent um the church's recent response to the pandemic. And there were some real questions about, okay, we we need to obey civil government, usually, but it's intruding on the church. But if this thing is as bad as they say, getting together could kill people. And and, and, and we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> we're not supposed to do that. The Sabbath is made for men, not man for the Sabbath. And so there were things for a little mm -hmm. while there that were cloudy. Yeah. And God's people wrestled with them and sometimes came up with different answers. But as things went along, we got a clear and clear perception of, okay, canceling church for a couple of day, a couple of weeks is one thing. Canceling it for half a year is something very different. And more and more people began to say, you know, um, we just eliminated fellowship with God, public worship from our lives for months. This isn't, this is not the will of God. Mm -hmm. Um, where people are sick or, or have legitimate reasons to be afraid of illness, that's one thing. But the church needs to be the church. And so that that was a hard one. But generally, do I need to get up every Sunday morning and decide, is it my, is it God's will for me to go to church? Lord, give me a sign. So that the sign I know, is it's Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> the sign is <laughs> your church be, is meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are, those are um, very sufficient signs that God has given us. He's given us uh, human authorities. He's given us pastors and elders. He's given us parents. He's given us spouses, employers sometimes, uh, older, wiser Christian friends who can point us to the scripture and says, you know, the Bible says this. Uh, I, I want to sign. How do I know if I should fall in love with this man? Is he a Christian? But yes, but what does Christian mean anyway? <laughs> okay, let's talk about what it means and why you're being ridiculous here. <laughs> but you know, I get I I get that with high school girls and junior high girls sometimes. Oh, he's tall, tan, and terrific. He comes to to youth group now and then. He says he's a Christian, or he's going to be a Christian any time now. In other words, he's not, <laughs> and you're being hoodwinked because you're gullible and infatuated. Okay, this again, this is not a question of having to find out the will of God. It's a question of having to do it. Mm -hmm. And and that could lead to a further consideration. I don't know for now, but sometime. When we start disobeying God, we stop seeing clearly the will of God. Mm -hmm. uh, our disobedience, our unbelief, clouds our judgment, clouds our thinking, uh, and it, it can be to an extreme. I'll give you an example out of my distant past. Um, two of my students at one point were the Weasley twins. <laughs> they were. <laughs> red <laughs> redhead and off the wall and all that. And uh, they, were, they wanted to form a rock band. And um, they began to, began to get flack within the church that Christians don't, don't do that kind of thing. And so one day I noticed that they're both late for Bible class. But one of them comes in late, ignores, you know, I'm late. Sorry about that. And just kind of comes in and plops down. And I'm trying to teach. And he stops me and says, what do you say to somebody who says he doesn't know if he even believes in God anymore? And thus began a conversation which lasted about 30 minutes between me and this young man. And you could have heard a pin drop the whole time. Because suddenly it was real forever. Because everyone knew exactly what was happening. His brother was having doubts about the reality of God because he wanted to play rock music in environments that many Christians would not have approved of. And he was getting flack and he was being basically told, at least by some people, that Christians can't do this. And suddenly for the first time, he began to wonder if there's really a God. 
Uh, he came out of it today. He's a pastor. Uh, but, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And I hope he's encouraging Christians to play rock music uh, in their he, free time. <laughs> I, last time I heard him, he was. Good. Um, he's a, in fact, he started as a, a minister of music and then mm. went on to become, as I understand it, a regular pastor of church. But, you know, there there was a moment and, and his brother was kind of caught in this dilemma of, oh, as far as I know, I still believe in God, but my brother is getting really weird and flaky and I don't know what to say to him. And so everyone understood what was going on and they they listened like everything while we had that conversation. Nobody interrupted. Mm -hmm. And then when we were done, it was clear that we were done. There was suddenly this, <sighs> as everyone breathed in <laughs> <laughs> and we went on and did other things and everyone started talking and all the, the attention was lost. But, you know. This is what sin and unbelief can do. You can you can look at something that six months earlier would have been black and white. Mm -hmm. Easy sleazy, no, 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 not a hard call at all. But suddenly, if you've made enough steps in unbelief and disobedience, finding the will of God may be difficult. So when we start talking about finding the will of God, yes, the Bible tells me so, but there's some things that go with that. One, you better make sure you're walking in obedience with the Lord, that you are doing the things that you already know. You should be examining your own motives in the light of God's word, making sure that God's glory, Christ's kingdom are your chief priority, not simply in there someplace. You should get as much information as possible so you can make good, well-informed decisions. And you should listen to the advice of those who are wiser and more experienced, like, oh, parents would be a start, <laughs> and uh, pastors and elders and such. And you should pray for wisdom. God promises wisdom to those who ask of him. Um, but his the wisdom he grants is not sudden uh, divine realization dumped into your brain in a flash. It's he will bring to your mind what you already know from Scripture. And therefore, the more you know Scripture and the more you've searched it out with regard to this particular thing, the more God has to work with. God can still convince you from Scripture of some very basic things. But if you want more detailed guidance, then you need more detailed study of what God's talking about. And of course, you should pray along the way that God will shut doors, um, open doors, protect you from stupid decisions, um, make your path clear, give you wisdom and good advice and all of these kind of things. And, you know, at some point, you can just, okay, this cho I have choice A and B. God doesn't forbid either one. I could do both to his glory. I could bear witness to him in either case. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a matter of particular lust or vanity or pride. These are just good choices. And I'm really having, I, I don't know which one to pick. Which one do you like? Well, I like, <laughs> I like this one. Pick it. But isn't that selfish or something? No, it's like chocolate vanilla. <laughs> Someone puts chocolate vanilla ice cream. You, you, God is not upset if you pick the one you like. Or blue if you pink. eat both of them. Or if you eat both of them. Too. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, so blue or pink socks, either one, or in the case of my girls, both, both. of them. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a choice. It's a choice. And it's, there's not a moral issue here. The last line of the, of the article, this discussion is based on, at some point, we should seriously take into account our own preferences and tastes. Sometimes it really is as simple as chocolate or vanilla, but some people really don't like vanilla, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think it is important to recognize the potential implications of making yourself live with something that you don't like simply because you don't like it and you think it'll make you better. I mean, like when I, I fall into that, I always end up being less patient at the end of the day. <laughs> I end up you know, wronging all sorts of people because I've put myself in this situation where I am frustrated with the choices that I've made. And it's my fault. <laughs> and it's like, I could have done less harm to the people around me if I had just, <laughs> you know, taken a bubble bath or something, you know? Well, see, your spiritual aspirations are higher than mine. <laughs> I just say, I don't care what they want. <laughs> what, I'm going to do what I'm best at and what I enjoy. And, you know, if, if, if some small child is wandering out onto the freeway, okay, yes, I'll go risk my yeah, life. Yeah, that's not a question child. of preference. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of other things, uh, if I realize I'm not good at it and someone else can do just as good a job, I don't need to do that. I have other things to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is that danger of, 
of picking the hard way simply because it's hard. <laughs> I Thank think you, JFK, that, right? Yeah, exactly. I think there are enough hard things in life that mm -hmm. that will come on its own. I don't think we necessarily need to. Maybe somebody can come up with some exceptions and show me some parts of scripture where God does encourage that under certain circumstances, but it's certainly not an, uh, an automatic. You have choices. Always pick the hard one because that will make you grow. No, God's right. great at finding hard things to make us grow. Yeah, he's got plenty of avenues for discipline, which yeah. does not seem pleasant at the time. Yeah, I mean, somebody yeah. told us that's going to happen. So yeah. I don't see any particular need most of the time. Now, parents with children, that might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You might give your child a hard task because you know it's good for him. But <laughs> they need a challenge. You, they need a challenge. But you don't do that all the time for everything. There's a particular reason and you are old enough and wise enough to see the end and what it will probably accomplish. Well, God is wise enough to see that for us, but to take that mm -hmm. upon ourselves can be a little presumptuous. Right. So, I will I will be con content to do the easier things until I see the value of the hard thing that I need to put all my energy into. There will be many such things. Marriage, children, calling, holiness. These are all things that are hard in themselves, mm -hmm. but they they bring the, the great reward of um, righteousness, blessing, godliness, joy, and peace. So, mm. Well, on that note, I think we should wrap up with some recommendations. Um, I forewarned Greg that I had a long recommendation, um, and that is something I've recommended before, which is The Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot. Um, there are two uh, movements that I think are particularly relevant to this conversation and one of the reasons that I love this set of poems so much. So I think I'm going to take executive privilege and just read them in, okay. in the recording here. And if you don't want to listen to the poem, listeners, congratulations, this is a podcast. You have the liberty to skip ahead. <laughs> Um, in the Four Quartets, T.S. Eliot is reckoning with time in various aspects. Is time the machine in which we're locked and that we need to find freedom from? How do we relate to the past and to tradition and to the future? Um, so in this, this part, he's mostly dealing with the past and tradition and values that have fallen away in his lifetime. He's writing in the 1930s. Um, no, sorry, this is the early 40s. So he's seen the interwar period and is reflecting on it. So this first one that I'm going to read is from East Coker. That is the second of the four quartets, and it's the fifth movement. And there's some French words, and I'm going to butcher them because I can't speak French, but I'll try mm. my best. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, the years of lentre du guerre, trying to learn to use words, and every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure, because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate with shabby equipment, always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling, undisciplined squads of emotion. And what there is to conquer by strength and submission has already been discovered once or twice or several times by men whom one cannot hope to emulate. But there is no competition. There is only the fight to recover what has been lost and found and lost again and again, and now under conditions that seem unpropitious. But perhaps neither gain nor loss. For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. And I'm going to skip over to the third quartet, again, the fifth movement. He's shifted to a discussion of divination, of looking mm. towards the future rather than to the past. To communicate with Mars, converse with spirits, to report the behavior of the sea monster, describe the horoscope, haruspicate or scry, observe disease in signatures, evoke biography from the wrinkles of the palm and tragedy from fingers, Release omens by sortilage or tea leaves, riddle the inevitable with playing cards, fiddle with pentagrams or barbituric acids, or dissect the recurrent image into pre-conscious terrors. 
to explore the womb or tomb or dreams. All these are usual pastimes and drugs and features of the press, and always will be. Some of them, especially when there is distress of nations and perplexity, whether on the shores of Asia or in the Edgware Road. Men's curiosity searches past and future and clings to that dimension. But to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time is an occupation for the saint. No occupation either, but something given and taken in a lifetime's death in love, ardor and selflessness and self-surrender. For most of us, there is only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time, the distraction fit, lost in a shaft of sunlight, the wild time unseen, or the winter lightning, or the waterfall, or music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. These are only hints and guesses, hints followed by guesses, and the rest is prayer, observance, discipline, thought, and action. The hint half-guessed, the gift half-understood, is incarnation. Here the impossible union of spheres of existence is actual. Here the past and future are conquered and reconciled, where action were otherwise movement of that which is only moved and has in it no source of movement, driven by demonic chthonic powers. And right action is freedom from past and future also. For most of us, this is the aim never here to be realized. We who are only undefeated because we have gone on trying. We content at the last if our temporal reversion Nourish, not too far from the yew tree, the life of significant soil. Well, I have nothing nearly as classy to offer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I will recommend uh, two books. One is the update of the other. When I was probably my early years of college, I don't even remember anymore. I came across a book called The Charismatics by... Uh, a pastor who I guess was just getting a reputation for himself. He was named John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And the book was pretty even in its tone and pretty polite and just pointed out here are some mistakes the charismatic movement makes. And it did some basic exegesis of key passages in a very familiar you know, everyday kind of guy kind of of level and pointed out some of the dangers of um, following your feelings. Um, I remember he starts one section early on by saying, I discovered this, I discovered a Bible in a used bookstore and on the inside cover was written, I don't care what the Bible says, I've had an experience. (laughs) So he, he talks a little bit about this and about how people have sought signs from God. I believe it's from him. I got the idea of uh, some some young man who wanted to know whether or not God was calling him to be a missionary in India, and he really wasn't sure he wanted to go. So he told God, I'm not going to India unless I see the word India written in letters like six feet tall. Next day, he goes to a missions conference, and there against the wall, indeed, is India spelled out in letters six <laughs> feet tall. So he's convinced now he has to go to India. Um, you know, God does have a sense of humor, and sometimes he does move us along through our own stupidity and gullibleness. Mm-hmm. And these are among his uh, secret instruments. The updated version is called Charismatic Chaos. It's a much thicker book. They're both paperbacks. And the second one's probably easier to find. Although in many ways, I prefer the first one. Uh, but the second one, he goes into some things that happened between the publication of the first and the second of the Minion Movement and some other things where people got really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is still one of the best um simple everyday approaches to the theology involved and the discussion of the signs and wonders that have been reported and things like that. So in the context of what we just talked about, uh, I think this would be a good buy for anybody who wants to pursue this further. There are works that are more theologically rigorous, but you know, sometimes they don't come to any better conclusions and they're not as easy to read. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with this. Cool. Thank you very much. And thank you for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Emily. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listeners, and our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, Let us know if there's a podcast catcher that you would like us to be present on that we are not currently present on. 
I just ended a sentence with a preposition, but uh, up with this, you will have to put. (laughs) Yes, you can beat me to it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Once again, thank you for listening. Uh, Check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, and Rumble. See you next week.